Good afternoon. It's Carol Dover, President and CEO of the Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association. And today we've got a pretty exciting, action-packed uh, webinar for you. First, before I get into um, my welcome or intro comments, I want to uh, welcome Kevin Johnson, who many of you know, who's going to also be part of this webinar, and Rick Van Warner, our partner at FTR Hospitality, who we so appreciate They've been with us through this entire COVID process. We've asked at the last minute John Horn, and you'll understand why. We have our executive committee member, John Horn, um, who's going to talk to you. And then we also have all of senior staff, all of our uh, Richard Turner and Samantha, the two lawyers on standby here. So um, we've got a, a lot of intel, but a lot to cover in a short period of time. So let me start with what wasn't originally planned for today, and that is the breaking news. So a few hours ago, the governor announced that he would have to close bars, and these are freestanding bars. Now, before we get into the, the, the details, let me explain a little bit. My, my morning has been um, completely consisted with calls from the governor's office to our regulatory agency, to Jared Moskowitz at EOC, to legislative. I've talked you know, to quite a few people in the administration about this. One of the biggest challenges the governor is faced with is the fact that the numbers have just skyrocketed. On Saturday, we hit about, we went from 2,500 to 3,000 overnight, but today we're at almost 9,000 cases. So it's tripled just since, just since Saturday and Sunday. So we've really just about not given the governor any choice but to do what he's doing. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about the details of, because our, all of our phones are blowing up with questions and media calls. This is standalone bars only, not restaurant bars. So he has, he has suspended the sale of alcohol on premise, COP on premise, for standalone bars that do not do 51% or more in food. However, those bars can sell alcohol to go. Now, let's talk about the restaurant side, which is what many of you today are asking a lot of questions about. Restaurants, bars are still 50% capacity. You can still sit at the bar using social distancing, but we have to adhere to all of these regulations, 50% capacity, um, and we're gonna talk about masks in a minute, but um, we've gotta make sure that we are adhering to all of the guidelines to keep our bars open. Now, with that said, let me tell you where we are going to be if we do not adhere to these guidelines, because every call that I've had today started with, you all are next if you don't start getting this under control. So we have a, most of you are adhering to the guidelines, but you all know in life it only takes one bad actor or a few bad actors to ruin the whole thing. So we have got to take a much stronger position. We are in control of our own destiny here, you all. We can control this, but not if by Monday or Tuesday we're at 20,000, 18,000, 20,000. If this thing continues to double and triple, I'm afraid that the governor's not gonna have any choice but then to start looking at, at restaurants. And that's exactly what we can't have. So what we wanna do is talk to you about, maybe it's, it's time for this industry to take a much stronger position. And remember that it's a voluntary position because we don't have any regulatory mandatory oversight. Your local government and the governor does. But this association is going to come out with some pretty strict guidelines on asking you to please wear masks, ask your staff, customers to wear masks until they get to their table. Um, temperature taking, many of you are already doing temperature taking, but if you're not, we're asking you to please consider it. Outdoor uh, waiting. I've been in several restaurants. I was in one last weekend. The wait was three hours long and people were just jammed up outside. 
you cannot do that. You have to give a, a phone number, text messaging, let them go sit in their cars, but do not allow people to congregate outside waiting on a table. Again, I could go on. We have the EOC order. It's going to be on our website. I'm, I'm confident that throughout this webinar, things are going to come up and, and will get answered as it relates to um, this issue. But I do want to say to you, every one of you that are on this call, government does not have the desire to control where we end up here. The only reason the government has had to come in and take this first step again is because too many are not adhering to the rules. So I'm pleading with each of you to please refresh your mind with the guidelines, know what the guidelines are. And if you don't think, if, you, if you're looking at the guidelines, take them a step further. If the guidelines say we don't have to wear masks in some counties, some counties have come along and mandated it. Guidelines say you can or cannot take temperatures. Y'all, we've got to take it a step further. You need to mandate this on yourself for self-preservation. So this time next week, we're not having a, a webinar to talk about another shutdown. So with that, I'm going hey, Chris, to- that's right. Um, yes, yes. Um, no, no, um, I don't know how to get to, uh, so I'm in Chrome settings. <laughs> okay, we have, a, we have one of our panelists having a challenge getting on. So you know what? Let's just do, um, Rick, this is Rick Van Warner. Rick, we'll just do vocals with you because we can hear you fine. So don't worry okay. about that. We can hear you. Sure, um, okay. too much, but we have a question about uh, where does tap rooms and breweries fit into this? If you do not do 51% in food, then you are going to have to suspend the service of consumed on premise alcohol, but you can sell alcohol to go. I was also told this morning by our regulator, food trucks outside of these places are also closed down. There's no, you know, this is, they are taking this incredibly serious, which they should, and they have to. We're gonna be here to answer, there's gonna be a lot of questions. We're here to answer all of the questions. If we don't know the answer, one thing is for sure, we know where to go to get it. So remember you all, prevention is the key. We want to continue to see these numbers going the other back down and not up. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Um, hey, just to, a, hold on. Just a brief thing about Let's Get Checked, Carol. I'm sorry. The Let's Get Checked. Oh, and now we've got yeah. Let's Get Checked. The Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association is a partner, you know, with United Healthcare. And as we start through this webinar today, you're going to hear a lot about temperature taking and test taking and getting, getting tested. Our great partner at United Healthcare has a program called Let's Get Checked. It is available now at, at home. You can have your employees, you yourself, managers, can have a test at home and purchase it through this program that we have for $119 per test. Members get 20% off, so please, if you're concerned about maybe, I know some of our testing lines here are eight hours long. There are other alternatives for testing. Consider mm -hmm. using our uh, United Healthcare. Yes. Let's get checked, check, please. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin. And now Kevin, if I could turn it over to you and thank you for all that you've done to help us navigate through these challenging months. Sure, thank you, Carol. Thank you. So we're going to talk a little bit. If we can go back one slide, I want to look at those CDC links just so people understand what they are. And Ashley, if you can get me the permission to share my screen, I'll put some of these up. But what we're looking at here are links to the CDC guidelines on how you should be running your business. They've come out with specific considerations for restaurants and bars that are very new. So if you haven't seen those yet, these are definitely things that you want to look for, okay? And they're very detailed. They're very good guides to this, and so I'm gonna see if we can put some of them up very quickly here. Hold on one second. All right. So can you see it okay? This is where you go on the web. You'll see considerations for restaurants and bars. There's a lot of great information here. They will take you through the behaviors that reduce the spread. 
Many of these are already captured in the FRLA guidance that we have put out on the subject. But if you want to go learn more about it, this is where you go, okay? It'll take you through what you need to do in terms of cleaning and disinfection. And it will take you through things like your layouts, physical barriers, and how you deal with healthy operations. So these are what everyone needs to be reviewing, okay? And making sure they read them. Each and every operator needs to read this for themselves and understand what's involved there. In addition to that, on our links, we also have the guidance for business employers. And the third one down there is implementing safety practices for critical infrastructure workers, okay? And that's also very, very important. So what these guidelines talk about, what they actually will do is they will, they will give you some specific guidance here that we're gonna talk about, which is when you can be around others after you had or likely had COVID-19. And they break it into two categories. They break it into people who know they've had COVID-19 uh, or they've tested positive, but they were asymptomatic. And the, you'll notice that the guidelines here are that you can return to be around with others after you've had no symptoms, okay, for at least three days. And it has to be at least 10 days since the symptoms first appeared. If you had no symptoms, but you tested positive, you still can, can't go around other people until 10 days after you've passed the test. The reason I'm bringing this up is when you shift over and look at the executive order that is in place right now, you know, one of the things that it makes clear is that we're expected to send people home once they have tested positive or displayed symptoms. Okay, it's either or. So on our slide, we'll, we'll loop back to that and I'll talk about it. But I want to show you something on this order. It says that the Department of Business and Professional Regulation you know, ensure, must ensure that we do screening and prohibit any employee from entering the restaurant premises if they meet any of these criteria. So there are five criteria there we have to satisfy in order to legally operate. Okay, if you're infected, you have to have had two consecutive negative test results. And they have to be separated by 24 hours. Some of us are operating under the belief that you only need one negative. Sometimes those tests can produce false negatives. You need to have two negative tests and they need to be separated by at least 24 hours. If you have signs or symptoms of the, of the virus, you can't be in the restaurant. If you've been in contact with a person known to be infected, you cannot be in the restaurant until you've tested negative within the past 14 days. And if you've traveled to an airport in the last 14 days, or you've traveled on a cruise ship within the last 14 days, you're not allowed on the premises. So how are you going to know that? You are going to have to ask your employees those questions. That needs to be part of your protocol, is not just doing the temperature testing, not just saying, hey, do you have any symptoms today? It's also, have you traveled? Did you go to that family reunion? Have you been in an airport? Have you gone on a cruise? because those things are also disqualifiers and we can't miss those. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing now if we can, and if we can pop back uh, to the, the slide. So let me make sure, Ashley, are we back to the slide yet? Yeah, we're back, Kevin. Right, okay, so going back to the slide, let's move to the next one. We'll talk about the practical nature of this. If you can take us forward one slide, Ashley. Right. Is that right? Is that right? Is this right, Kevin? No, next one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go back when I was looking at the wrong screen. Got too many screens open here. <laughs> so go back. This there one, you right? go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> I pulled myself. How about it? So these are the, the, what you need to do. If you have a sick employee on the premises, and remember, we are defining sick as being either that you've developed symptoms or that you've tested positive. If they've developed symptoms while they're at work, you have to send that sick employee home and they're not going to come back to work until they've been symptom free for at least three days and they've had two negative tests separated by at least 24 hours. Now, some of you may have read the CDC guidelines and noticed that under the CDC guidelines, CDC originally approved another method of returning people to the workplace that they could come back if they had been symptom free for 10 days and you didn't necessarily have to have a test as long as they'd been out for 10 days without a fever for the last three. That doesn't apply, not under the executive order, okay? The executive order, the way we're reading it, takes that off the table. You are going to have to have negative tests to get employees back to work. And I know there may be people that say, well, my attorney said differently or this, that, and the other. Guys, I think we're in the position where everyone in the world would like to dunk on us right now. And we need to take a very conservative position on this. And we need to make sure we're doing everything that order says. 
because we do not need to give anyone in the governor's office the ability to say that we weren't following the clear language of that executive order because it's very clear that we have to have tests in order to return people to work. They want us to close off areas that are used by the person who is sick. We need to clean and disinfect a sick worker's workspace. CDC guidance is that you should try to wait 24 hours if you can do that, or if it's not possible, as long as practical, before you clean or disinfect, which means that if you had someone serving a section, okay, in your restaurant and they have to go home in the middle of your shift, don't seat anybody else in that section or the tables around it, okay? Make sure that you get that restaurant clean. You're probably going to want to clean it that night or early the next morning before you get customers back in there. We've had questions about, you know, what type of cleaning do I have to do? Do I have to hire an outside company or do I need to use my own? And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. But you do need to make sure that if you're using your own employees, you're getting them all in there. You are paying them for every hour that they work on that work party. And you're paying them at full minimum wage or better. Tipped employees don't work on that work party at their tipped rate. Now, once you are looking at the other things you can do, you can open your outside doors and windows. You can increase the air circulation in there if that's possible. And then you need to start thinking about contact tracing. And what that means is we're collecting information about who they contacted, who were they, they were in touch with up to two days prior to symptom onset. So you have a 48 hour period you need to trace to figure out who they came in contact with. This is also where it gets real interesting, okay? Because if you've read the CDC guidelines, you know that they say for critical infrastructure workers, you need to focus on people that they were in close contact with defined as within six feet for more than 15 minutes. When you read that executive order, it does not say close contact. I'm sure the governor's office had the ability to read the CDC guidelines. I think you need to be careful, and I think you need to assume that contact means contact. So if they had more than any kind of passing contact with someone, you need to assume that that's somebody who needs to be tested. Okay, and I've had calls with a lot of clients recently where clients have been taking more aggressive postures and have been saying, you know, look, we do it, you know, only if somebody was around someone for you know, 15 minutes or more and they were within six feet, or we do it only if they weren't masked up during that time. We've talked about it. Now's the time to go stronger than that. Okay, because our choice is this. I know the folks are out there that have looked at that. You're going to say, listen, if I have to shut down everybody that that person came in contact with, you may be talking about half my restaurant staff. And if I have to put them out, and if I have to wait for them to get a test, it's gonna take two or three days to come back. I may be shut down for two or three days because I just can't field a team to run that restaurant. Here's our choice. We can either be shut down for two or three days, or we can do something that's looser than that, and we can be shut down for two or three months. And so this is an area where, like Carol is saying, we are going to have to be more aggressive on how we're doing this because we have to demonstrate our good faith to the government and to the governor because otherwise we're going to take the hit on this and you know, i know there's a ton of great operators out there who've been doing everything they can to bend over backwards and to try to get it right and you you, you all know what free riders are right free riders are the ones that take advantage of the situation and just take advantage of the good people and they are much more lax and our problem is the free riders right now are killing us the ones that don't have the guts to enforce the distancing requirements who aren't doing this stuff right in terms of contact tracing, who aren't doing it right in terms of masking and things like that. But they make it really hard on people like John who's doing everything right to run his business. And so it's incumbent on us to make sure that we are 100% on this. Just the same way that if you were in London during the Blitz and they were dropping bombs on you at night, you had to be 100% on blackout curtains. You, know, you couldn't say, well, I feel like getting some fresh air tonight or I'm tired of being cooped up in the dark here. Everybody had to have their blackout curtains up or else the bombers knew where to go. It is the same thing here. If our industry depends on this, we have to be much tougher on it than we have been. And I know that puts pressure on us because we all have operations to keep going. We all have things where our operators say, if I do that, it's gonna make it impossible. Well, our choice now is customer safety or operational expedience. And you know which one the governor wants. You know which one Carol has said we need to focus on. We need to put customer safety and employee safety above everything else right now, no matter how hard that is. And that's the best choice if we want to stay open. Because otherwise, if we can't do that, if we admit defeat on that just because it's hard, 
then we're gonna be shut down for two or three months because those numbers are gonna keep going up. So let's go to the next screen here. All right, so ADA requirements. The ADA says that when we do have someone get sick, we are not going to be able to tell everyone in the restaurant, hey, John got sick or Mary got sick. Can't disclose their name, but you still have to make sure that you do tell people, hey, we had someone that tested positive, okay? And how you do that, how you go about it is very, very important. You know, I've heard Chris Frawley do an excellent demonstration of the way you go about that. And if anyone you know, wants to hear it, you really gotta go to him to get, get the full effect. But his point is you gotta go in and you gotta tell people, listen, we've had an, ex an exposure, one of our folks has been tested and come back positive. We're doing everything we can to maintain our operations, to keep you safe. We are doing 100% of the things the CDC requires, and we're looking forward to going ahead and continuing to operate tomorrow, and we're gonna count on you to be there. And just to say it with a very positive tone, very positive approach, so that that person is not spooked and freaked out by the message, okay? So that's real important. But you do need to make sure that if you're writing down any information about someone's condition, whether it's a positive test or whether it's someone that came to you and said, hey, by the way, I'm immunocompromised right now, or I'm, I have HIV and I can't be around all this stuff. You cannot let that doubt get out in the workplace and get shared with other employees. You need to keep that private. You may have employees come in and say, look, because I'm immunocompromised, I can't come to work right now. And I know you've got me scheduled, but I need to take time off. That's gonna be a reasonable accommodation in most cases under the ADA. If they have something that rises to the level of a disability, and they need time off, you can give them time off. You do need to look at the circumstances. If you are covered by the FFCRA, which is the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act, you know that it had part of it that was the Employee Paid Sick Leave Act that talked about two weeks of pay for paid sick leave. And if somebody is under doctor's orders to go observe a quarantine, or if they're experiencing symptoms and they have to go get tested, then they may be entitled, if you, if you qualify under that, remember this is businesses under 500 employees, they may be entitled to sick leave pay for that. Otherwise, you can probably do that as leave without pay. All right, let's go to the next slide. We have up on here, be aware of local requirements uh, regarding mask wearing. That was you know put up there probably a couple hours ago before the governor's announcement came out. And I think I would communicate that even more strongly now. If we can go back one slide, Ashley. Uh, that local requirements regarding mask wearing, even if those local requirements do not require people in restaurants to wear masks, like Carol said, we probably need to go the extra mile and say, you need to go ahead and wear that mask while you are waiting on our premises or while you're walking to the table. You're welcome to take it off when you get to the table to eat and drink. But otherwise, while you're around other people, you need to be wearing a mask. Okay, because that will keep people safe. And that is the extra mile that we need to go to. And this is understandably a strong message. And some people may say, well, listen, I've had, you know, all people almost get in fights with my hosts or my servers because there's people out there that feel very, very strongly about their constitutional right not to wear a mask. What do I do? How do I, how do I deal with that? Okay, well, the first thing up here is post your rules. Make clear the extent that they're based on a local ordinance or upon you know, a state you know, executive order. Put that up so your customers understand where you're coming from and emphasize that if you don't do it, it may lead to a full shutdown. Now, what about if you go the extra mile and you say, listen, in my restaurant, you know, we are requiring mask wearing until you get to the table. And somebody argues with you and says, well, Orange County doesn't require that yet or Hillsborough County doesn't require that yet. And by the way, the constitution, my rights, and this and that and the other. You know, I think you're gonna to have to come up with some guidance for your managers, and you're gonna to have to have managerial support for whoever the front of the house staff are that are delivering this message. And that's, that needs to go something like this. And I'll ask Rick Van Warner to maybe clean it up for me in his section. But here's how I would do it right now. I would say, I respect your feelings about your constitutional rights. I don't like it when people step on my rights either. Here's how I feel about my rights. I'm a private business, not the federal government. I have the right to control my private property. I have the responsibility to keep my guests, my employees, and my business safe. Nothing in the Constitution gives you the right to enter my property without wearing a mask, much less to put my employees and everything I've worked for at risk. No shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service. So your choice is you can either mask up or you can move on. 
And you can probably put that a little less blunt and with a, a little more pretty please on it, but that's the general gist of the message we probably need to be delivering to customers if we want to stay open. And I think it's just really, really important. You need to know that liquor licenses are at risk. If you're violating these rules, you may lose your liquor license. You may have it suspended. You should know that DBPR, the local law enforcement are under a lot of pressure to go out and find this. And I think Carol can probably speak to this, but you know, what I've heard her say is every time we go in and try to advocate for the industry and try to say we're doing everything possible, you know what? There's a video that's shared on social media of someone who's a bad actor, someone who is not following the rules and has jammed as many people in as they can and everybody's doing shots and they're all about two feet from each other you know, with no masks on and it's just one big party. And every video like that makes it absolutely impossible for Carol to defend the industry. And so we have to start putting pressure, real peer pressure on the people that are not doing it right. And we need to welcome this kind of enforcement. So make sure you're on the right side of it because that's the only way we're gonna to get to stay open. All right, should we go to the next slide? Rick, it's your turn, I'll let you take over. Okay, well said. Uh, I think it's um, just to go back to where Carol started things today. For anybody who doesn't get this now, we are on the brink of having the industry be shut down again uh, for a period of time or going to takeout and delivery only. If we don't get this thing uh, turned around quickly and, and get everybody wearing masks and getting and doing all the other social distancing and all the other recommendations that we've shared. Um, on the I'm going to speak quickly to the communication side and then we can take questions on a lot of these areas. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing is you've got to be communicating uh, to guests and with your team, especially, what are you doing? You know, hopefully those those are, you know, temp checking every employee before a shift. It's, it's the wearing masks of employees constantly. It's no one being allowed to work sick. It's uh, cleaning and sanitizing on a very regular basis. It's, a, it's hand washing on a very regular basis. And it's understanding that, that um, when somebody, if somebody is very uncomfortable, and a lot of this does come down to communicating uh, with each employee to, to re reinforce and remind them of all the all the positive steps you're taking to keep them and guests safe. Um, but if somebody still is uncomfortable with working, they have you cannot. One of the some of the the worst problems that have arisen in the media are where employees felt pressured. To, to work even though they weren't comfortable or their parents weren't comfortable having them work. So you can't, you know, don't force people to work with the threat of losing a job. Um, communicate with confidence, you know, if, instead of calling somebody and say, look, you know, if you have a COVID-19 employee, and let's face it, just about everybody has. Uh, and, and the ones that, that haven't probably will. So, so the point is that you have to communicate with confidence. If you and one of the one of the best practices that um, one of our our members shared yesterday was was just calling up each person before they come to the shift. Look, you know, um, someone on the team has tested positive. However, you should feel good about here's all the different things we're doing. You should feel safe that that you're probably more safe in our four walls given all the steps we're taking than you might be elsewhere um, and uh, see at your shift as opposed to calling up someone and saying hey so you know we have somebody that tested positive not sure if anybody else is going to be sick you know what do you think are you going to come in and a lot of this has to do with communicating with confidence and and really being strong in enforcing and taking the steps you need to take every day to do the right thing on on keeping people safe. Um, the other thing is, don't try to um, to hide. You know, if you do have an employee that comes down sick, again, as uh, Kevin mentioned, you can't mention their name under under privacy laws, et cetera. But you need to be transparent with the team. Otherwise, you're going to end up with rumors, and they're keeping it from us, and and those those lead to problems. And so you don't want people speculating. If we can go to the next slide, please. So what about the media? John, and I'll let John chime in on this one, but I think that John was a good example of what I would normally advise, which is 
you know, you've got to be prepared to respond, but I'm, but we're not really advising publicly announcing um, that there's been an employee or two that have tested positive unless um, it's a significant outbreak um, with a cluster of guests or employees that involve several people. Uh, in John's case, I believe, um, you know, the biggest thing is communicate all the positive things you're doing, just like you would with the employees of, and being ready. Again, I wouldn't proactively go out there and do it, but have that, have that stuff ready and know that you can back it up, that this is what we've been doing. And we're not just doing this because someone tested positive. We've been doing this since the beginning. We've been taking these steps to keep our employees and guests safe all along. Um, and, and it's really important that, um, and John, I believe, and I'll let John speak to what happened in his case, but he, by, by, you know, in his case, somebody tipped off the media, an employee or whoever, that there had been a positive uh, case in his restaurant. And uh, so the media did call. And in those cases, you can't just duck or say no comment. You have to respond to it as John did. And by laying out the, the steps they had been taking all along, the article that came out, um, or the report that came out, was was pro was way more favorable than it might otherwise have been. John, you want to add anything in on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to because you you have to make sure that you've done pre communicating with your staff and with your guests. We've been putting out a weekly newsletter of here's what's going on since COVID, just to make them aware of what's going on. So. I had more support when the news article came out of people saying he's been doing everything the right way. We've been in there. We've seen the cleaning guy that's walking around with his orange vest to make sure everything's all the high touch areas. He's got QR codes on his tables that will take you right to his menu. So there's a no touch menu. It's all electronic. He's done this, that and the other. And the, the headline was uh, two cases of COVID at a popular Bradenton seafood restaurant their first or they are not going to close and so it was tried to spin that well shouldn't everybody close and and when i spoke to the reporter i said this is everything we're doing you know we're cleaning all the high touch places we're doing this we're doing that there is COVID in our community it doesn't matter where you go we're doing above and beyond what anyone's doing to protect people and we all of our staff are in masks all are in gloves they're changing gloves they're washing hands we're doing everything above and beyond, which is what we all have to do is be above and beyond what's required. And, and the, the, the support was overwhelming. Um, there was one girl, one of my staff that, you know, was really against what we had done. And she said she quit because of this, because she didn't know that um, the person had, had contracted, had a positive test. And then I spoke to her on the phone and, and, and said, uh, you know, I should have, you know, we should have absolutely told you specifically. And she said, uh, well, I was going to quit anyway. And so she's turned around. She said, I really appreciate the phone call and blah, blah, blah. And she's pulled back on that. So it's all about the communication. You couldn't, you know, Rick couldn't be any more clear about that. It's the most important thing you can do in a positive way. You've got to be ready. It's not a matter of if you're going to have a positive case. It's a matter of when you're going to have a positive test for COVID. And so you got to be prepared. You've got to have your procedures. You got to have your protocols so that your entire staff know what to do. We uh, put out frequently asked questions so that if someone at the table, and I got calls from guests all the next day, hey, we were there on Sunday. Was that person working? Blah, blah, blah. You've got to have protocols that you have the right people answering those questions, but we put it out to all our staff. Here's what to say. Here's what to communicate to the guests. It's got to be a positive and it's got to be a, you know, you can't hide from it. That's that's the worst thing you can do is hide. So. Thanks, John. That's perfect. Um, I think that ensuring another piece of preparation is make sure that you prepare your managers to handle these questions. And as John said, your staff, in a lot of cases, um, it, it might be recommended that you have your managers handle specific guest questions as it relates to COVID, as well as with the um, the race issues going on in the protests in, around the country, because you know you're you're putting a lot of pressure on somebody who's an hourly employee and trying to run four or five tables to have to handle those. Um, but make sure your managers are prepared, and make sure that especially when it comes to a potential phone call that from somebody says they're with the media or somebody showing up that's with the media 
make sure that all employees know that the policy is to is to direct it to a manager and make sure that the managers know that the policy is to get it to the person, the owner or or the spokesperson of your group that would um, that would then take that that question. Some of the the most damaging situations have happened when somebody just tries to wing it, you know, an employee or a manager, uh, you know, with a camera on them. So uh, that's that's um, very important to make sure people know what your policy is. Um, next slide, please. What about social media? I mean, unfortunately, we've, um, you know, now everybody has a megaphone, no matter who they are. And in a lot of cases with the things going on in the country right now, um, both the virus and, 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 and both the protest issues, um, you know, we have a lot of people are baiting, you know, or trying to bait on social media, using uh, restaurant or hotel company websites to, you know, social media platforms to say, well, what's your stance on this? Or what are you doing on this? And, and generally speaking, you don't want to really engage in these except in very extreme circumstances. And if you do, you should probably enlist the help of an expert or two on if you're going to engage on something that's, that's extreme. Uh, typically, responding is only going to create a bigger debate and a bigger issue online. And a lot of times, especially with the people who are baiting out there and the, and the people who are trying to stir the pot, or if you have one disgruntled former or current employee that's trying to stir a pot, um, they won't get much of a platform or much of an issue unless the company jumps in and now all of a sudden you've escalated the situation. Um, just for, as a matter of, you know, obviously First Amendment rights, um, employees can complain and, and disparage you online, and that's that. Most of that speech is protected, so you're not you're not going to win by trying to go to war on that on that front either. Um, I think the key again, and John just said this. It's it's the stuff that John's doing, um, and other other good operators are doing, which is it comes down to leadership in each restaurant. And you know, if there's a good relationship and an open dialogue between the managers and the teams in these restaurants, you're not going to have that you're you're much much less risk of having somebody go out and create a real ma major public problem for you online. Um, and then the last thing, it's it's uh, this is kind of obvious, right? Um, but you just can't take sides. I mean, we're in the hospitality business. We're 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 in the business of serving and welcoming everyone, regardless of differences of of race or sexual preference or opinion or politics or or religion or anything else. So the idea that um, you know to take sides is just not a, a not a um, a good place to be. Um, and I think and Rick, next, if yeah, I could just ahead. add something right in there, Rick, yeah. it's the whole thing. I think one of the things that diffused the reporter here is he said, "Well, did you consider closing?" And I said, "We considered that three three weeks ago when we knew we would be faced with this, and we thought that what we're doing and we're with our sanitation." You've got to let them know you've planned for it. It's not something just off the hip, like, oh my goodness, I've got someone with COVID. What should I do? You've already planned for it. You've you've made that decision and you've made what you consider an educated. I mean, I said I've talked to medical people that have informed me that I've made the right decision or by by doing this. So the more you can have pre-ready, you're you're much better off. Hey John, and this is Dan Murphy. Just a comment. Uh, one of our restaurateurs yesterday said they had to be careful because you may have a COVID-19 employee come into your restaurant or come to work, and he may not have got that or caught that at your restaurant. He may have been out somewhere else. And when he's let, if everyone knows, even whether it's you can tell everyone who has it or not, then they can. The, the, the other employees, if you're shut down for two or three days, they felt like they are they did something wrong. And so another reason why you may not want to close. It does give everybody a, a sense that, oh my gosh, did I close down the business? Did I cause them to close down? And so then they may not they may not reveal that they have a fever. They may not reveal they have, you know, all the different symptoms. So I mean, yes, we're temping everybody, but you're also asking them those questions, just like Kevin said, have you traveled? Have you been on a cruise ship? They may say no, just because A, they need to work. They've made the decision they, they need to work and they don't want to put everybody else out of work. So 
we all just have to do better. Good point. Um, next slide, please. So this is a tough one, right? Um, I think that, you know, as John just said, I mean, John's decision is where more and more operators that we've spoken to have have landed, because unfortunately, the choice is almost to shut down altogether for a period of time, or to continue powering through with with cleaning, you know, and and all the steps we're taking day in and day out. Um, but there's a lot of questions you got to ask if um, once it, you know you have to try your best to get to the you know to the bottom of what's the level of exposure. Um, is it somebody in the front of the house or is it somebody in the back of the house that might have been working largely alone or or maybe with one other person, but really hasn't had any any contact with guests or exposure to guests? Uh, when's the last time someone worked? I mean, a lot of times we'll, we're finding out that that the person may not have worked for four or five days, but tested positive. Um, which coworker is that person living with, dating, or or uh, you know? living with you know maybe the roommates um should, or socialized with you know who's been out to the you know who's all gone to the karaoke karaoke bar together um i guess they won't be going this weekend um should we pay to test you know another question that that comes up a lot and and then we'll open this up to questions i think in a minute um should we pay to test all employees well, I think the short answer to that, based on a lot of what's, what's been the guidance we've gotten most recently today, as well as what Kevin's section is, yes. <laughs> the problem is, is what test are we sending them for? You know, I mean, an antibody test does not show whether somebody has, has is currently positive or negative for COVID. So, you know, and, and there's also a lot of questions about the reliability of the test. The other issue is that the day somebody takes a test, that test is really good for less than 24 hours because they could go out that night and catch it. So there's a lot of problems around this, but putting yourself in a position where if you have someone positive, you've taken every possible step to protect your other teammate, the other members of the team, as well as a guest is, is critical. And what about this uh, question? And Kevin brought this up too. And, um, should we clean ourselves or hire a third party? Well, which one is going to have more, which one's going to resonate more clearly with the employee team? Well, it's doing it ourselves, obviously. This is what we should be doing every day anyway. But to deep clean, you know, possibly close for a period, but a lot of people are closing it or are deep cleaning at night. Uh, but to go out and get a third party, you know, possibly. It's a different it's different situation than a hep A outbreak or something you know stuff that we're used to handling that way but this is a this is a whole different ball game and you know the 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 amount of um, buy-in that you get out of having out of cleaning yourselves is 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 probably worth because they know then the type of safe environment that they're part of creating every day. And again, that gets back to the not having employees that are sniping at you on social media or in the in the mainstream media. Um, and then the last one, and Kevin, you you touched on this, and feel free to jump in. But what do we have to? When is it okay to let somebody back? And and you know, I think Kevin touched on that. Refer to those guidelines. But I, you really got to have be symptom free without fever reducing meds for three days and. Uh, in the case of um, the state, it's two negative tests these days. So uh, I don't know if you want to add anything on that, Kevin. No, that's right. We just really have to, that is the situation where you pay for the tests. I don't think we necessarily need to try to test all of our uninfected employees each day for the reason you mentioned is that that test is only good for 24 hours. So you might be just burning up dollar bills at that point. But once they are symptomatic, you definitely need two negative tests spaced 24 hours apart before you bring them back. So but, that's 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 basically adding three more days, I mean, at the rate of return on their on the test right. result now. So right. three, four days, probably after the 10 to 14 days. So it, it's tough. It's absolutely they, tough. You can get them tested in there. I mean, I wouldn't start paying for tests until they're symptom free. I'm but, saying if someone's yeah. been positive to bring them back. Yeah. 
you give them 10 days and in, in the time, then they go get a test. It's three to four days to get a result and you do another one 24 hours. You've got a long span. I might test them on day six or day seven if those symptoms have disappeared. Yeah. Just so I think just to wrap up this little section and we'll go to questions I think is next, but um, I think it's really important to to just reiterate that, you know, two weeks ago even, or even a week ago, maybe probably two weeks ago, we might have said, you know, a lot of this is common sense, right? You do you don't let somebody work sick, which is our, our should be our standards to begin with, right? On in, in normal times. But these are not normal times by any stretch of the imagination. And we're in a pickle now to where not only are staffing levels challenging and and com you know compounded by having you know people that might have been exposed sent home and so forth. But we're in a we're in a situation where we're, as an industry we've got a gun to our head on this thing, and we just have to follow and adhere to these guidelines. And and uh, and the bad actors are killing us. And you know, a lot of it I think was the bar side, but that's personal opinion. But but um, you know, we we have got to to get after it, and now or or we're going to be facing the same thing that that bar owners are are now faced with right Rick, now. What do you think in terms of, would you expect that we might see some employees of bars jumping on social media tonight to criticize the governor or criticize the government for doing this? And is there any communication message that we should have for them about supporting what's being done or about the necessity of it? Well, it's, I think it's already, it, they're already against it on, on Twitter in our area. The local bar owners are, people can sit in, in a restaurant and eat and drink and but they can't sit in a bar so it it will be there if not already yeah, and i don't it it's it's a tough one because let's face it a lot of a lot of the um anecdotal evidence is is showing that there's clusters of cases that are popping out of bars where there's largely 20 30 somethings mostly 20 somethings or younger that are congregating in in big groups and so i think it's 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 a tough one but but you know it should be a lesson to the restaurant side that we have got to be even tighter and do, and do even better if or we're going to be in the same boat so next slide i don't know if it says questions on it or not yes um real quick carol i think we still have a bunch of questions about bars versus who can be open who's not okay. So try to clarify that a little bit. Okay. And I got a couple questions for Kevin, and of course a couple for Rick. Um, a lot of just. Okay. This webinar will be available and sent to you afterwards. So if you miss some things, I'm also going to recommend that you go to the FRLA website and and uh, click on our COVID-19 page. A lot of information. The executive orders are on there. So a lot of questions on that. So we don't repeat ourselves on this call. Highly recommend you. And if you're not getting our emails, our newsletters every week that we send out, make sure we have your correct email and you'll get that every Friday. Okay, send it to us. Real quick, go right. ahead, Carol. Okay, Which, let me do this one more time. If you are a standalone bar and or a nightclub and you do not do 51% in food, you have your, your liquor license has been currently suspended. There will be no more alcohol sales except, and that's for on-premise. You are allowed to sell to go. Now, let's go over to restaurants. If you are under Chapter 509, licensed as a uh, food service establishment, which I'm going to assume the majority of you on this call are, your bar, if you happen to have a bar that is attached to your restaurant, your bar is fine. It's just like it used to be. Your bar can be open, 50% capacity. You can serve up at the bar. People can sit at the bar, but you have to adhere to social distancing. Tables inside of your bar need to be six feet apart. But you, you can continue to operate the bar and, and operate up at, at your bar, bar seating, so long as you're six feet apart. 
So make it very clear. I'm getting, we're all getting lots of questions and they're all the same in that if you're a restaurant, you're, it, it, remember in the very beginning, right after he opened us up and that second phase of phase one, that's where we are right now. We're at 50% capacity, both inside the restaurant and inside of your bar. Is that? And you can't, this is meant that you cannot be served. You're not mingling around the bar. You're not standing around right. the bar. You must be seated. Seated, seated inside and the bar. Social distance. In the table. Yeah, it's not a bar environment where people can just, you know, gather and party. This is a go down, go in there and sit down. Somebody did ask me a question about bar top tables. You can have a bar top table that you can have that. Um, preferably you have bar top seating there. Um, again, to Samantha's point, it's not for mingling inside the bar and having a party type atmosphere. Kevin, I have a question for you. Um, this might be kind of complicated, but uh, how do you contact tracing if you can't disclose who is positive? It's a real good question. You're really depending upon the memory of the person that got it. You've got to talk to them. You've got to say, tell me who you were around. Tell me what sections you were in. Tell me what was going on there. Some operators I've heard are actually going back and watching video from within the restaurant to see who they were around and where they went. Yeah. Right. Other than that, those yeah. are two best options. Okay. Um, Real quick, sorry, there's a bunch of them, Kevin, hold on. Um, what if the employee's religious beliefs are prohibiting the testing process? That's all you, Kevin. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, Kevin. Sure, you don't want me to get I'm glad you volunteered for this. <laughs> so this gets into the sincerity of the religious belief, and I think, you know, initially speaking, I would not pe let people just try to pull one over on me. The Supreme Court says we have to give them some leeway yeah, they don't necessarily have to point to a passage in the Bible that says, you know, I, I don't have to submit to temperature guns or go to a viral test because it's obviously not something that would be there in the first place. But, you know, we're just not going to let have everybody gang up and decide, hey, it's against my religious belief. It's got to be a sincere religious belief. All right. And we need to err on the side of trying to get them tested. Uh, if they do have that objection, I would say, you know, have them stay out until they submit to you some evidence of why they why that's their religious belief. And in the meantime, call your employment lawyer and we'll see if we can get some guidance from the governor on religious exemptions. I would think that they would ultimately be granted, but I would want to make sure we are not abusing that privilege and that it's not used as a game to avoid the, the thrust of the regulation. Carol, we have a couple. Thank you, Kevin. Here. All right. So we're getting a ton of questions about pool bars, beach bars, bars that aren't attached, this type of bar, that type of bar look at your license if you if that particular license that you're operating that sale of alcohol under and richard turner you're on the phone i know if it is licensed as a under you do not serve 51 percent food and you are a bar license no you cannot sell alcohol from there but you can sell alcohol to go um yeah. but your pool bars in the hotels are licensed under the hotel license. And those bars will, will use, most everybody serves food at the pool as well. Um, Richard, do you have anything no, to that's, add? And, and you said the, the premier thing, go back when all of this first started and when you were, uh, if you were closed down, you're closed down now. And, um, yeah. And again, the whole purpose of this, unfortunately, a bar has a little bit different personality than a restaurant. Um, you're there to mingle and have small crowds and, and uh, drink and have lots of laughs. And it is because of that closeness that uh, the spread of COVID-19 is uh, the most severe. And, and that is the reason they're closing them down. Uh, the point to be lost is is try not to be clever if you're not supposed to be open and take a look at your numbers if 51 percent of your revenue is coming from uh something other than food you know pay heed take a look at your license and see how you're licensed and um you know go from there otherwise 
uh, you'll start running into problems. But regardless of how you're licensed, do not let people conjugate at the bar. Get them seated and um, keep your distance. Exactly. exactly. And, and just to heed the warning, they are starting to revoke liquor licenses. Uh, let me, so, let me, if I can emphasize that, Carol, let me tell you, this is a no jokes situation. I am sure both at the governor's office and at the secretary's office, this is beyond critical. And they are going to send out the troops in mass and they're going to make examples. And what's worse is that if we're not careful, uh, the next example is going to be the restaurant industry. Yep. And they've given us fair warning. I have to tell you, they're not doing this without coming to us and, and telling us what's coming next. Every call, like I said, when we started this, every single call said, you all are next if this doesn't start getting fixed. So please, please, please do whatever it takes, mask, temperature taking, adhere by the rules, six foot distancing, don't congregate, everything we've talked about here, and then some, because we've got to get this thing turned around. We do not, we cannot afford a, a all right, outright closure again. Well, we've got to get this message to the bad apples is what we've got to do. Yeah. Because I doubt anyone on this and, webinar are bad apples. Right, right. I would agree with you, John. And so that's why uh, we're going to be getting something out of this office again. We put a guidelines out a couple of days ago that were a little more soft shoe, and that was prior to the bar situation. It's not going to be quite as soft shoe this time. We're going to put something out that's a little bit more heavy handed to get people to understand, as Richard said, this is the real deal, They're, this is serious. And if these numbers, y'all watch them, you get them locally. We're at 9,000 today. If you guys open up the paper tomorrow and the state went from 9,000 to 11 or 12 or 13, you better get ready. You better think, what, what can I do? What can I do to help this? And we're all responsible. Cheryl, I think we're getting a lot of questions about the executive orders. I think if we put together all the different executive orders, they're all a little different, a little hard to read, and we kind of, we'll try to try to summarize those a little bit. Also, want to, also uh, we have nine regional directors around the state. They all do a phenomenal job. They all have Zoom meetings once a week. Uh, if you're new to the call and you want to want to get involved in those Zoom meetings, the little, they're, like they said, they're very informative. They, things are changing day by day. And those regional directors are on top of things. So uh, feel free to email us and, and let us know how we can help you. Carol, anything? We're, we answered a lot of the Q&A, but want to keep it short and brief. Yeah. Um, most, of the, most of the questions we've answered, I know there's a lot of them, but uh, we'll try to answer anything else. We've been, on now? we've been on an hour. So. Uh, anyone else, Rick, before we leave, or Kevin, any, John, anything else Thank you, you. add? No, it's, it's dead serious for all of us. Thank you to everybody who has signed on and remember, wear a mask, be serious, take it serious. Call us if you have any questions, we're here for you. Thank you, John. Good way to end it. Thank you. And thank you to the hundreds of you who logged on today. I was getting a lot of messages. Wish, wish everybody had logged on to it. So thank you. We had a lot of people. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.